Welcome, I'm Sulabai Doyle and this is the Puranic Geography of Bharatvasha. Section 3 The Divisions of Bharatvasha I'll now proceed with some new geographical information found buried deep within the Puranas. Puranic geography of Bharata is not a topic that has been studied by our Acharyas. They have differing views, but they don't waste their time trying to reconcile differences by studying the genealogies of Bharata or the Kalpa of a particular description. One difficult problem found by most modern ISKCON researchers is the huge so-called unknown region of Bharata's other Dweepers, thinking the Earth is one of them. Because they are ignorant of the relationship between their geographic yojana, the Jyotish yojana, and the traditional yojana, and because they have no idea what or where Indra Dweepa is, they speculate with this model and that model. For example, look at this 8 mile map of Bharatvasha. We can see through logic alone that the 8 mile yojana will never work for Puranic Bharata geography. Creating theories about disks and balls and whatever is like the modern cosmologists creating a universe of 95% dark matter and dark energy to support a broken model. Indra Dweepa and Kumarika have been found and the geographic yojana for this kalpa has been calculated to make everything match the Bhagavatam, the Puranic and the Jyotish cosmology. Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur complains that the list of divisions of Bharata, namely Indra Dweepa, Kasheru, Tamrapana, Gabastiman, Nagadweepa, Somya, Gandhava, Varuna, are not described anywhere. However, in this context, the Skanda Purana, describing the Samhadi Kalpa, has given a detailed description of the creation, location, size, the kings, and the kingdoms to be found in Bharata's nine khandas. Just like every other Varsha and Septa Dweeper of Bhumandala, nothing is left out, except the hunters of Europe and Siberia. In one Kalpa, the Dweepers are named after the nine grandchildren of King Bharata, eight sons and a daughter. They are not divided by ocean, but together are surrounded by ocean and divided by mountains and rivers. Indra Dweepa lies on the east of India, including Bengal and Odisha. The region belonging to Kumari is central northern India. In a very long narrative about the life of Kumari, all 72 kingdoms and frontier states are listed, including how many cities and villages are included in each kingdom. Even the number of beaches on the coasts are given for the entire Bharatvash, which in this context includes all of Central and Southern Asia. The Markandeya Purana also divides Bharatvasha into nine regions, each being represented by a portion of the great Korma Avatar. When the Korma faces east, kingdoms at its head include Assam and Lohitya, that Dweepa is separated by mountains. Korma's belly is the middle of Bharata, once called Brahmavata. This Dweepa is encircled by mountains and rivers. His other limbs indicate Odish to the southeast, bound with Mount Mahendra and ocean. Karnataka in the south by Mount Malaya and ocean. Shorastra southwest by Mount Pariyatra and the ocean. Persia and Turks to the west bound by mountains. Bactria bound by Hindu Kush and the Caspian Sea. Kashmir and Tibet to the north bound by ice and the sea of hot sand. And the ninth dweeper is eastern Tibet of Kiritas and Chandalas. What about all the Puranas that say humans cannot travel between the dweepers of Bharatvasha? We can plainly see most of these khandas are attached to the ocean Sagara Samvrita, surrounded all together by the ocean. Here is a verse from the Linga Purana, however. Some have migrated to Indra Dweepa, some to Kasheru, 
Some have gone to Tamradwipa and Gawastaman countries. Some have gone to Navadwipa and Somyadwipa, while others have migrated to Gandharvadwipa and Varunadwipa. Some are Malachas and Palindas born of different races. The Brahmanda Purana also identifies where Indradwipa is. It says one branch of the Ganga passes through some pious tribes in the mountains, a mountain lake called Indrajumna, down the mountains where the donkey trails are, and where Shivites live in bamboo. She passes the land of King Janaka, which is Mithila, and pushes through the delta with crocodiles and reaches the salt ocean at Indradweep. Why devotees have not located Indradweep before can only be due to the wacky translations of the British supremacists. These translations of mine are being checked by His Holiness Banuswami and others. They confirm that Indradweepa is the land from Bangladesh to northern Odisha. Now we have grasped the creation of Bharatist Dweepas from other Kalpas, but what about our present Kalpa and what about the Bhagavatam? According to the Bhagavatam, Bharatvasha is named after King Bharata, son of Rishabdev and the father of Sumati. The divisions of Bharatvasha are conspicuously missing in the Bhagavatam because a standard list occurs in at least 12 other Puranas. As we have seen in section 1, this decision is likely because the Bhagavatam is a compilation of Kalpas and the dynasty of Bharata provided is said to have come from the Sarasvata Kalpa and this is cited in four other Puranic sources. The lineage of the Bhagavatam's Bharata is unique amongst all the Puranas. It is not equivalent to the four Puranas which claim relevancy to our present Kalpa and Yuga. In brief, the Bhagavatam states Bharata ruled Bharata with the help of his nine eldest brothers named Kushavata, Ilavrata, Brahmavata, Malaya and others. These are the closest thing to the Bhagavatam's nine Khandas. It is even possible they ruled regions called Indradweepa, etc. But this is not stated, and nor does it concern me, for it is not our Earth's creation history from this Kalpa. When Bharata retires to the forest, his kingdom is divided amongst his five sons, uh, which is overseen by his son Sumati. Dividing Bharata into five regions is described in the Mahabharata, which is a current history from only 5,000 years ago. What is interesting is a map of regional divisions of Bharata over the last 2,000 years. We can see from this map that natural boundaries form borders between regions, in contrast to the idea that Bharata's nine regions are separated by ocean. It is helpful to remember that Srila Prabhupada's comment about the definition of islands in reference to the divisions made by great-great-grandfather Priyavata Maharaj is this. The example set by Maharaj Priyavata in marking off different states is still followed. As indicated here, different classes of men are destined to live in different areas, and therefore the boundaries of various tracts of land, which are described here as islands, should be defined by rivers, forests and hills. So far I've reconciled the dual terms Bharatvash Karma Bhumi and Bharatvash Punya Bhumi as descriptions of Earth and India. I have reconciled the various descriptions of distances within the karmic zone of Bharata Shetra with Kalpa Beda, Yuga Beda, the mental construct of the Earth's sphere, Siddha perception and Sankhya semantics as described by Rishi Raj Prabhu, and the Achintya hyper dimension available to rishis and gods that keeps us bewildered prisoners. I have pointed out the overlapping models of Puranic geography, Jyotish mapping, modern histronomy and Puranic cosmology in the Bhagavatam in line with Sariputta Prabhu's principles. 
I have defined the mysterious dweepers of Bharat Vash and concluded Earth is not a khanda but the human perception of the entire karmic Vasha. If this is reconciled, how do we explain two very simple conundrums presented in the Bhagavatam? The first is how we see the sun overhead and the other how is day and night created on this flat strip of land called Bharata? Now let us study the logic of the description given in the fifth canto of the Bhagavatam. Looking at this image, it makes no sense at all that the sun, millions of miles horizontally away from the earth, and only 100,000 yojanas above sea level could possibly appear directly overhead anywhere on earth especially within the tropics. This description in the Bhagavatam does not match what we see, our common sense nor simple mathematics. This is why previous analysis of the fourth dimension or Siddha dimension is called achintya or inconceivable. No plausible explanation of this is given. The next conundrum described in the Bhagavatam is how day and night are created. The Srimad Bhagavata 5.21.9 states People living in countries at points diametrically opposite to where the sun is first seen rising will see the sun setting. Now we find another dilemma and to make it clearer look at this similar statement from the Surya Siddhanta. Chapter 12 Around the middle of the Meru in the directions of the east and at equal distances in the ocean are the four cities made by gods in the different Vashas. To the east of Meru at the fourth part of the earth's circumference in the Badrashya Vas is the city called Yamakoti. To the south in the Bharata Vash there is a great city called Lanka. To the west in the Ketumala Vash there is a city called Romaka. To the north in the Kuru Vash there is the city called Siddhapuri. When the sun passes overhead at the Bharat Vasha, at the same time the sun is rising in Ketumala Vash and in the Badrashya Vasha we have sunset and in Kuru Vasha we have midnight. This means that when the sun is millions of miles north of Meru, the country of Utakuru experiences midday, while Bharat Vash experiences midnight. We are told the sun is rising in the eastern Varsha and setting in the western Varsha. Now think about this. This means all of Bharata Varsha experiences night time. Not one speck of sunshine drops on Bharata because it is rising in another Varsha, not here. It also has already set in the western Varsha. So there are no rays of sun falling on Bharata. This is the problem. Since when? is all of earth experiencing night time. Never! This explanation is ludicrous. It does not make sense. It does not match what we see every day. This is totally inconceivable. Now I have seen the answer by studying the works of Sataputta Das. But the point I make is no mechanical or logical model can enable any earthlings to see the sun when the Shastra says all of Bharata is in darkness. However, because people will ask me about my model, the flat bow-shaped strip of land that cannot be escaped by travelling in any direction, I have to give an answer. Now this answer is completely nonsensical, but that's just how the Puranas and Jyotish Vedangas explain it. The first thing we do is take the map of Jambudweep and stick it on a globe so that the coastline of Jambudweep lies along the imaginary equator of a spherical Bharat Vash. Okay, this makes no sense. Um, please look at the new illustration. So all this is going on mathematically, but somehow it is affecting the flat land of Bharata. It must be that fourth dimension landscape in the videos I showed you. 3D people can't understand what's going on in a 4D world. They only see a 3D projection, which makes no sense, a chincha. By following this process, 
what were heavenly varshas on the other side of the universe are now just vacant miles of saltwater ocean here in Barata. That's right, the cities we heard of just before, Yamakoti, Siddhapur, Ramaka, have all just turned into seawater that is clinging on the sides of an imaginary earth sphere hanging in the ether. Now, because we are limited, little jivas, without superpowers, we suddenly see the sunrise in the east of our world. When the sun is actually shining at midheaven upon a city from an angle of less than one degree, 125 million miles sideways. We don't see what the devas are seeing. The point is, every calculation you make using this Jyotish system accurately tells you where the mystical projection of the sun and all celestials will appear in the dome sky above a flat world at any given time. It also predicts worldwide travel and world time zones. The maps you are seeing combine concepts of Puranic and Jyotisha geography. In my opinion, the Earth is flat, but behaves like a globe in space. This inconceivable difference is understood through the Vedic explanation of consciousness and Sankhya, or equally through the scientific explanation of the holographic or higher dimensional universe. I have pointed out the overlapping models of Puranic geography, Jyotish mapping, modern histronomy, and Puranic cosmology in the Bhagavatam in line with Sataputta Prabhu's principles. I have defined the mysterious dweepers of Bharatvash and concluded Earth is not a khanda, but the human perception of the entire karmic Vasha. Section 4 Bharatvash's Ocean and the Upadweepers Welcome to the magical land of Bharatvash, where nothing is as it seems. Now let's get back to Earth and discover what the ancients called those continents and islands that were usually full of primitive natives. While warriors of Aryavata were throwing nuclear arrows and flying around in Vimanas, we have discovered the divisions and kingdoms of ancient Bharata, except for the islands in the ocean that are caught within the Kamashetra Loka of Bharata. The Bhagavatam only mentions some of these once and without any description whatsoever. Just two verses list them amongst 18,000 verses. This is not a mistake by Vyas or Sukadev who wish to present Krishna Bhakti, for there is ample information about all the earth in the Puranas and Mahabharat. It's like if you are interested in Bharata geography, don't look in the Bhagavatam. So first of all, how were these islands called Upadvipa or Anudvipa created? Were they created by Brahma at the beginning of his day, like the Vashas of Jambadweep? Well, apparently not. It seems that during the time of Vaivasvata Manu, of this Brahma's day, an ancestor of Sri Ramachandra was responsible for creating them, maybe around 60 million years ago or earlier, before the sacred Ganga came to this earth. This narration is from the Ramayana. The 60,000 sons of King Sagara dug up 60,000 square yojanas of land looking for the sacrificial horse. This equates to 9% of Jambadweep. Since Jambadweep's non-mountainous area is 6,761,000,000 square yojanas. The Bhagavatam says eight islands were created by this digging, including Ravana's Lanka and Sinhala, which is today's Sri Lanka. The Vayu Purana lists eight other islands, but including Lanka, while the Mahabharat mentions Earth has 13 islands. Meanwhile, the Varaha Purana lists Lanka, another new island of Bharata, and three islands belonging to Utakuru Vash. The Ramayana describes various islands to the east and west of India. It is important to consider which Kalpas named these islands, but it is safe to say there are more than eight, according to Sudha Goswami speaking the Mahabharata 5,000 years ago. It is clear from the Ramayana, the suns dug in all four quarters, but of Jambudweep only, 
up to the salt ocean as they met each of the four cosmic elephants helping Ananta balance Bhumandala on Korma's back down near the lowest netherworld. They dug tunnels under the earth in the east, the south, the west, the north, killing and frightening the residents and creatures there. Then, as they were tunneling back toward the east, they saw the ritual horse grazing near Lord Kapila, who turned them to ashes by chanting one syllable. But however, the Vishnu Purana states, the sons found the crevice through which the horse had wandered, reaching Lord Kapila's heavenly ashram in Patala, where he turned them to ashes with a glance. In any case, Patala can be reached through the salt ocean too, and today Kapila's ashram is glorified by where the Ganga enters the sea at Sagar Island. Let us now journey south of Bharata in the Lavana Samudra, the salt ocean, and see the islands there. The Vayu Purana states that in this ocean is an island, four and a half thousand miles long. This is using the Vayu Purana's geographic yojana of 1.5 miles. It has a great mountain range with fresh water lakes and rivers. Many tribes live in dwellings carved into the mountains. They are uncivilized, keep their facial hair, and have bluish black complexions. Obviously, inhabitants change during the yugas, but no other continent across the sea from India is this large, and no other peoples are that black. It must be Africa. The next island listed is named after a peacock and is surrounded by thousands of other islands. Some are 30. 45, 75, 90, and 150 miles across. Some are said to be one and a half thousand miles across. All these inhabitants are inferior, non-Aryan, or mean, like hunters. There is one island southeast of India, which is shaped like a peacock, and its peacock-shaped peninsulas are called bird's head and bird's tail peninsulas today. It is certainly surrounded by thousands of islands of all sizes. But how many islands are one and a half thousand miles across? Papua is 1,500 miles long, New Zealand is a thousand, and the width of South America is 2,000, like halfway down. Undoubtedly, Bahina Dweeper is Papua, and the islands of Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia are included perhaps even South America. The next verse describe another six well-known islands of Jambadweep that lie near Bharata, and many trade items are discussed, including precious metals, gemstones, and island products of coral and sandalwood. They are called Ungadweepa, Yamadweepa, Malayadweepa, Shankadweepa, Kushadweepa, and Varahadweepa. The continent of Ungadweep though having mountains, rivers and forests, is vast and flat like an ocean. It is well known for its coral and its gold. It is filled with uncivilized tribes, a multitude of fauna and flora, and is surrounded by a shark-infested ocean. There is a mountain in the center of that snake-ridden country, with springs and caverns which is worshipped by the natives. Every part of this description describes Australia. Malaya Dweeper has abundant mines of gems and gold. It is also the best quarry of sandwood amidst the oceans. It has silver mines too, and two glorious mountains, Maha Malaya and Mandara, endowed with many flowers and fruits. This island is easy to identify. I have looked for the largest source of sandalwood in the Malay archipelago and found that Java also has two very high mountains, one called Sumeru. Java has gold and silver mines and was known by the Ramayana as the Yavadweepa Islands of gold over the ocean to the east of India. Yamadweep is similarly filled with quarries of gems, minerals and is the source of rivers and gold and it lies next to Malaya Dweep. 
The Vayu Purana describes Lanka as a beautiful island with the opulent golden city of Lankapuri built on the Trikuta mountain, which was hundreds of miles long. However, the Skanda Purana tells us that after the Lanka battle, the bridge was submerged and the king Vibhishana regularly flew his Vamana to worship the deity of Rameshvara. The Surya Siddhanta and other Jyotish portions of the Puranas state Lanka resides in the ocean on the equator, directly south of Mount Meru and Ujjain. There is only a submerged ocean ridge there today, extending all the way to India. This is not surprising since Lord Rama's Treta Yuga was over 17 million years ago in the 24th Yuga cycle. The Vayu Purana lists Sankadweep. Sankadweep, which extends through 100 Yojanas, is an abode of many uncivilized tribes. There is a mountain Sankagiri there, like a white conch shell, which is sacred, a quarry of many gems, and is inhabited by the pious. The king of the Nagas once made his capital there. The white conch shaped Kinabalu Mountain in Borneo is very recognizable. Kumudradweepa is adorned by varieties of flowers. It is full of many villages, an auspicious quarry of varieties of gems. In that island, Mahadeva's consort Kumuda is worshipped. An educated guest is used here to associate this region with Thailand and Cambodia surrounded by the ocean. Here we see the wonderful pink Kumuda lotus lake and images of Durga and Tara who are worshipped here even today. Varaha Dweep is full of various uncivilized tribes inhabited by many species of life and it has many villages and towns. It abounds in wealth and crops and is filled with religious people who live along the great stream of sweet water called the sacred Varahi River. At that place the people worship the Lord in his form as the great ram or boar. The beautiful Mount Varaha is there, adorned with many valleys, caves, clefts and springs. It is surrounded by various rivers, hills and forests. We have now been given the name of the great island in the first verse of the Vayu Puranas chapter. To the west of Bharata, that hosts both those blackest of natives and the immigrants from Bharata who worship only Vishnu in his Varaha forms, they practice Vanashrama in the cities along the Nile or Varahi, which remains sacred to this day and is said to emanate from the foot of God. The Ramayana confirms that the Varaha mountain lies across the Arabian Sea from Bharat Kunda. The Vayu Purana and my presentation finishes here. The Purana declares these ancillary islands and are the territories and islands of Bharata widely spread in the south. Thus that single Varsha consisting of many islands has been described here, which is known as being divided by the water of the oceans into multiple fragment tracts of land. There is much more to tell and more of Jambudweb's heavenly islands to discuss and the matching with the Bhagavat list of Anadweepers in the fifth canto. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, my grand guru, to Gorgo Vindaswami, his dedicated disciple, and to all the assembled Vaishnavas.